Okay, we're on. Lucy? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Lucy Bernholtz. Um, my video is not working because of a Wi-Fi problem, but I'm here behind the screen. Uh, it is 3.04, and I'd like to call to order this uh, regular meeting of the San Francisco Elections Commission, 3.04 p.m., Wednesday, December 15th, 2021. Um, Secretary Delgadillo, would you take uh, call call the order and take roll, please? Sure. I just, I just take the roll. Thank you, Madam President. The minutes of this meeting will reflect that due to the COVID-19 health emergency and to protect commission members, city employees, and the public, the meeting rooms of City Hall are closed. However, commission members and staff will be participating in today's meeting remotely. This precaution is taken pursuant to the various local, state, and federal orders, declarations, and directives. Commission members will attend the meeting through WebEx video conference and part participate in the meeting to the same extent as if they were physically present. Public comment will be available on each item of this agenda. Each member of the public will be allowed three minutes to speak. Comments or opportunities to speak during the public comment period are available via phone call by calling 415-655-0001. Again, the phone number is 415-655-0001. Access code is 2480-061-6924. Again, 2480-061-6924. Followed by the pound sign and then press pound again to join as an attendee. You will hear a beep when you connect to the meeting. You will be automatically muted and in listening, listening mode only. When your item of interest comes up, dial star three to raise your hand to be added to the public comment line. You will then hear you have raised your hand to ask a question. Please wait until the host calls on you. The line will be silent as you wait your turn to speak. Ensure you are in a quiet location. Before you speak, mute the sound of any equipment around you, including television, radio, or computer. It is especially important that you mute your computer if you are watching via the web link to prevent feedback and echo when you speak. When the system message says your line has been unmuted, this is your turn to speak. You are encouraged to state your name clearly. As soon as you begin speaking, you will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're on the line with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you change your mind, press star three again, you will hear the system say, you have lowered your hand. When a phone is not available, you can use a, your computer web browser. Make sure the participant's side panel is showing by clicking on the participant's icon. Make sure the participant's panel is extended in the side panel by pressing the small arrow indicator in the panel. You should see a list of panelists followed by a list of attendees. At the bottom of the list of attendees is a small button or icon that looks like a hand. Pressing the hand icon to raise your hand. The host will unmute you when it is time for your comment. When you are done with your comment, click the hand icon again to lower your hand. Once your three minutes have expired, expired staff will thank you and mute you. You will hear your line has been muted. Public comment instructions are also on page three of the agenda. Public comment will be submitted in writing. It will be shared with the commission after the meeting has concluded and will be included as part of the official meeting file. Written comments should be sent to elections.commission at sfgov.org. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, you, I thank you. Ahead, yeah, I will go ahead and, and take roll call now. Uh, President uh, Bernholz? Here. Vice President John? Uh, yes, here. Okay, Commissioner Jordanic. Uh, Commissioner Chapel, here. And uh, Commissioner Mogi may be joining us later. She I'm here. here, right here. Oh, you're here. Hey, I am Commissioner late. Mogi. I'm Hi. <laughs> time. Time. Okay. So, with five five commissioners in presence, we meet quorum. Great, thank you. Uh, item number two, uh, discussion and possible action on resolution on continuation of remote elections commission meetings. 
Uh, there's an attachment, which is the city attorney memorandum regarding public meetings and findings motion draft resolution of the San Francisco elections commission. Uh, I will not be reading this resolution as we've read it at each of the last several meetings. Um, but given that the situation with uh, COVID-19 continues, um, if we can get a um, motion in a second to um, approve this uh, resolution for this meeting, that would be great. So moved. Uh, we've got a movement by uh, Charles uh, VP Jung. Second. Seconded. Uh, Secretary Delgado, if you take the roll. Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. Comment? Is there any public comment? Oh. I don't know if we need public. Uh, I don't see any hands raised. I need to scoot this over. Yes, I don't see any hands raised. Okay, if you call the okay. vote. Sure. President Bernholz? Yes. Uh, Vice President Jung? Yes. Commissioner Jordanik? Yes. Commissioner uh, Chapel? Yes. And Commissioner Mogi? Yes. Okay, with six yes, the, the motion passes. Thank you. Item number three, general public comment. Public comment on any issue within the election commission's general jurisdiction that is not covered by another item on this agenda. Uh, Secretary Delgadillo. Uh, let's see. I do have one hand raised. Caller, I'm going to unmute you. You have three minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. It is Mr. Pilpel. Um, so I, I'm hoping that I can just do a minute or two <clears throat> and wrap up all of my public comments uh, on your meeting at this point. Um, so on the minutes, I um, communicated some suggested non substantive edits to Secretary Delgadillo, and I'm hoping that you can just uh, take those. I think there were one or two things that still needed to be uh, sorted out, but um, I hope that, that that's useful. Uh, I support items uh, 6 and 7. I have nothing to contribute at this time on 5 and 8. I support the director in your performance evaluation. And my only other comment or question is I am wondering where the uh, letter from the October meeting on federal legislation is. If it is not yet posted on the website under letters, that would be great. And if it is, I didn't see it there. And if someone can point me to where it is, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, uh, Thank you all very much and uh, hope to talk to you more next year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Pilpel. I believe that that letter has been drafted by Commissioner Mogi. Um, am I correct about that? Mm -hmm. um, it was um, also submitted and sent. Um, so it's, um, I think it should be in all of your inboxes. So Sec Secretary Delgadillo, if you can help post it. Um, that would be great. Okay, I will. It was just sent, so hopefully it's not much of a time difference. Great. Thank you so much, thank Commissioner you. Mogi, and thank you to thank Mr. Pilpel for Mr. bringing that to our attention. Um, item number four: approval of minutes of previous meetings, discussion, and possible action on draft minutes of the commission's November seventeenth, twenty twenty-one regular meeting. Noting that uh, Mr. Pilpel has also been in, already been in contact with Secretary Delgadillo. Does any um, member of the commission have comments or, or uh, edits to those minutes? Seeing none, uh, can I get a motion to approve? To approve. Thank you. A second. Second. Thank you. Um, any comments from the public? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, then we can move to vote. Okay, President Bernholz, how do you vote? Yes. Vice President Jung? Yes. Commissioner Jordanik? Yes. Commissioner Chapel? Yes. And Commissioner Mogi? Yes. Thank you. With five in Wonderful. the affirmative, the motion passes. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item number five, remote ballot completion project and submission for people with access and functional needs project. Discussion and possible action regarding the remote ballot completion project and submission for people with access and functional needs project for which San Francisco issued a RFP in April 2021. 
there are some attachments uh, for this, and I also want to recognize and acknowledge uh, the several uh, uh, leaders from the city who have joined us for this meeting. I'm very grateful to people to these people for making time to be with us here today and appreciate also uh, the materials that have been submitted in advance. So, in particular, I'm speaking of um, uh, Linda Jarrell of the Department of Technology. Thank you very much for joining us. Deborah Kaplan from the Mayor's Office on Disability. Francis Zamora from the Department of Emergency Management, and Craig Tijic, who I'm sure I just uh, did a terrible job of attempting to pronounce your name, uh, from the Bay Area, Uasi, the general manager. Um, so this is an item that has been on each of our last, I believe, three agendas. We are continuing to try to understand this project, um, and I'm very grateful for these colleagues for joining us here today. I want to note in particular for the members of the public, as well as my fellow commissioners, that in a uh, document that was submitted for on, um, uh, from Mr. Zamora and I assume Mr. Chitik uh, uh, regarding a statement on enhanced election security access and functional needs remote ballot project, and in the email to which this document was attached, Mr. Zamora has noted that the identity and access management technology part of this project is no longer being pursued. Um, that may be um, a clarification on one of the key questions and uh, areas of interest of the commission, but if I could um, just uh, ask I'll ask direct this question specifically to Mr. Zamora, and then there may be other commissioners with other questions for other of our guests. Um, what was not clear to me in the documents you submitted, and again, thank you so much for joining us and for sending this. Um, the email is dated December 13th. Says. Please note, Bay Area Uasi will not move forward on pursuing identity and access management technology, but will instead focus on an equipment purchase, on equipment purchases that enhance voting accessibility for people with disabilities. My two questions have to do with um, when was this decision made? When was this change made? And does this then have budget implications for the entire project? Um, and I'm directing those questions specifically to Mr. Zamora since he submitted this. So he's got his hands up. I can see that in the. Oh, and Commissioner Jordanic, did you want to chime in before? Uh, I think maybe could could we promote each of the four people to be panelists so we they would be on the video, and then they could try and join us. That ah, way. okay. Is is that possible? Yes, it is. I can go ahead and promote. Uh... Mr. Zamora now, I'll make him a panelist. Thank you. There you go, he's a panelist. I might as well also do Director Jarrell, uh, oh. Mr. Gijic, and um, Deborah Kaplan as well, please, if they're all here. Okay, I see Mr. D, I, I, I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce it, I apologize. Um, I don't see Deborah unless I'm, I see Scott Kaplan, maybe that's the one. Okay. Uh, Kaplan is a member of the Bay Area UASI management team. And so that is that is not the same uh, person as uh, <laughs> Deborah Kaplan. <laughs> thank, thank you. Well, thank you. I will do it. If Deborah, Deborah Kaplan is is uh, on the line, if, if you'd raise your hand, it's not visible to us in the names on the participant list. And if not, that's that's on. Or as a caller, I am so sorry. I don't. I oh, Mr. Kaplan, I'm so sorry. I don't see where I can demote you. Participant. Hmm. No, that's not working. I will work on this. I apologize. I I will. Um, okay, Martha, I, I can believe you just we can continue. Time? Yeah, can you just check to see if there's anybody else with their hand up? That would be uh, Deborah Kaplan. If they're there. Uh, don't see any hands up. Okay. Does she know okay. to press That's star three to raise the hand? Again, uh, Deborah Kaplan, if you're with us and you're not 
uh, on the computer, but you're calling in, it would be star three to raise your hand. I still don't see any hands raised. Okay, let's proceed with the conversation. Secretary Delgadi, if you just keep your eyes on that, see if in fact, Deborah Kaplan is out there trying to get in. I apologize for the technical difficulties. And again, my uh, welcome and thank you to our guests. Um, uh, Mr. Zamora, if after all that you uh, remember my questions in response to your email, um, that would uh, I can repeat them if not. I, I think I have it. So, but it, it, certainly, if I if I miss something, uh, President Verholtz, uh, please please remind me. So, <laughs> so thank you, uh, Honorable Commission, and thank you for having us, Francis Zamora, Chief of Staff, San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. I'm joined by Craig Dizik. That that is the pronunciation. Craig Dizik. He's the general manager of the Bay Area Uwazi, and a few members of his management team are also on the call. And so uh, I just want to start by saying that um, you know, as a Bay Area, we are committed to uh, making voting more accessible for people with disabilities. Concurrently, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has also made it a priority, uh, a national priority that uh, has identified um, election security as one of their homeland security grant requirements, and so. To meet the needs of this requirement, these do kind of dual priorities, uh, we consulted with the uh, San Francisco Department of Technology, Department of Elections, and the Mayor's Office of Disability as subject matter experts to identify a project that could that could meet these needs. And so, um, as you stated, we we understand that there is some confusion as to about this project, and that there are many that are concerned that this project will lead to an internet voting platform. And so. Um, well, we hear that um, the Bay Area WASI has uh, made the decision to modify this project, uh, really, so we can better understand the needs of people with disabilities and ensure alignment with the uh, VHS security grant program priorities. Um, there's there's a number of reasons why we, we are doing this. Uh, number one, um, timing. Um, in order, to, uh, there is a performance period associated with this grant, and so in order for us to be able to spend the money in a, uh, a timely manner, we have to meet the performance period. Given uh, given the um, what is what has happened with uh, COVID over the past couple of years and the and the way in which the timing in which we received this um, this national priority, we don't feel that there's enough time to complete an identity and access management project. But we also we also recognize that the, there's some confusion as well, and so uh, we believe we can take this part of the project out and still accomplish the, the dual priorities of uh, making sure that we we evaluate options. For, for people with disabilities, but also um, meet the homeland security uh, priorities uh, of the project. To your question, uh, you know, when was this decided? We had discussions with our project partners about it uh, last week, and then uh, and uh, finalized that decision on Monday. Wonderful, thank you very much. And again, thank you for providing this email in advance. Are there budget implications then to taking that out of the project? Um, I'm, I have a, I'm, I'm going to answer briefly and then Craig, if you can fill in, but, um, you know, we believe with project modification, we can meet the timelines of the, of the, uh, of the grant performance period. Craig. Craig, if you can, and you, you're probably on mute. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Mr. G's there you are. Not on mute. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for inviting uh, us to participate at your meeting. Uh, Craig Giesick, thank you for trying my last name. You're very brave. Um, I, I'd like <laughs> to just emphasize a few things. Number one, this is a regional project. It is not a San Francisco project. It's a project for 14 jurisdictions throughout the entire Bay Area, UASI with 100 cities. We received the uh, the uh, NOFO uh, back in in February of 2020 without really a heads up regarding these national priority projects. National priority projects are projects that are significant throughout the United States that are, are representing 85% uh, of the national risk. Uh, such as cybersecurity, and and as we've seen in the presidential election of 2020, uh, election security is at the highest uh, priority. Um, we started this project, uh, and we reached out to our subject matter experts because we, we we do not have a a bearing on election security. As we approached, you know, into 2020, 
due to a, a, um, a reconciliation between Cal OES, which is the grantee, and DHS, uh, all the national priority projects for the California Ewasis, and there are six in the state, have been put on a financial hold for six months. So we were behind the eight ball from day one. In October, we were notified of that and of 2020, and then back in, uh, I think in June of 2021, they were released. So we were, you know, trying to catch up with this, um, with these projects, and they only have a 14 month period of performance, meaning that the project needs to close on December 31st of 2022. Now that um, we are, are moving into 2022, we, we looked at uh, phase one, and, and that is a gap needs assessment for the entire region, meaning regional uh, stakeholder engagement, and, and that should have started back in October of 2021, which we have not started at all, and we don't look like we're going to start that until sometime in, in either January or February. Being that now we're seeing a new variant with COVID, the Omicron variant is going to have some delay. And I like to put everything into perspective. And back in 2020, we did not have, in the beginning of that year, we didn't have COVID coming about. Uh, in February is when we started to uh, um, experience that. And in the city of county of San Francisco, we went remote from in-person meetings, and, and many of my team were uh, uh, were uh, deployed as disaster workers to the Moscone uh, Center. So that, in and of itself, put us in a delayed position in any of all these projects. Now that we're experiencing a surge in the new variant, that is another determining factor that we need to rescope this project. And 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 yes, um, we we determined that would be the best avenue through for the region, and there is no budgetary implication. X amount of money is delegated in phase one as a gap and needs assessment, and X amount of money will be then looked at based upon that. Uh, a gap in needs assessment for looking into the, a purchase procurement based on best practice is throughout the United States. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, background and also for answering my question. Let me welcome Deborah Kaplan from the mayor's office on disability. Who's joined us as a panelist. Um, those were the 2 questions that I had uh, specific to the memos uh, provided again. Thank you all for. Um, responding to the invitation and providing this background information, uh, other commissioners. Commissioner Jordanik. So, uh, thank you everyone for being here. I just want to start out by thanking all of you for. For canceling the portion of the project that we were concerned about. And it wasn't the identity access management per se, but there was some language. In the RFP that specifically, and also a little bit of the project narrative that was um, sort of underlined in, in the memo that I, I wrote that we were concerned about. But I, I do want to thank you for um, addressing that concern. Um, and I also, just before I get into my question, I do want to thank the Office of President Shimon Walton and also Supervisor Matt Haney and um, the Chief of Staff for Shimon Walton, Natalie G, and also Matthew Mandich of Supervisor Haney's office for um, meeting with the Department of Emergency Management staff last week and bringing more attention to this issue. So I do wanna thank them. But um, I do have a few questions and I'm not gonna dwell too much on the identity access management portion just because that, that's not being um, pursued any longer. But um, can you tell us, one of you, what will happen with the, um, the RFP and the bidding process and so on? Are you still gonna be using that winning bidder to do either one or both phases? And um, could someone address that question? Greg, I think this is a little bit more uh, for you. Yes, um, no, we, we, we will not. 
uh, because it's a significant change in our scope and we would then uh, pursue um, in a timely basis to issue an RFP. And I believe that is our, our, our goal. And, uh, and if my team is on this, they can correct me if I'm misstating that. But, um, oh, um, uh, we probably would do like a mini solicitation based upon a pre-qualified RFQ list. Okay, great. And then as far as communicating the change in the project to all the different counties, um, how and when do you plan on doing that? Well, number one, this is not a change to the project. Phase one has always been phase one. It was a, it was a gap in needs assessment for all the, the, the 14 jurisdictions in the 100 cities. So that as soon as we can get into a contract, we would pursue that. And based upon those needs, we would tailor our, our phase two project as soon as possible so that it would complete the deadline of December 31st, 2022. Okay, I guess I was referring to the in the document you provided. It's called the proposed phase two modification. Or that, is that, that, is, be... that would be based upon the the completion of phase one. Okay. All right, and then um, this may be a question more for the the San Francisco based um, people present, but is there any possibility that this plan would continue in some form? The portion that was canceled. Is there any possibility that would continue in some form as a San Francisco only based project? Because I know this was something that the Department of Technology had been working on prior to the grant process. So is that a question specifically then to Mr. Zamora, Director Jarrell, or Deborah Kaplan? I think probably Director Jarrell and um, Deborah Kaplan, I think, would be the two on that one. Would I can either unmute if, if you'd like. I, I This is oh, Linda Jarrell. I was able to unmute. My okay. little slow today. Um, so, Linda Jarrell, I'm the director of the Department of Technology in the city CIO. And it's good to see everyone. Um, sorry, <laughs> we're not in person. It's always it's always a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, so the question from Commissioner Jordanik was: Is there uh, plans to have an identity and access management um, project for disabled voters? And the answer is no. Thank okay. you, Director Jarrell. So, um, President Bernal, those are all my questions. For now, I think. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioner questions for our guests? Okay. Uh, again, I, I want to ask our guests to please stay for uh, just a bit more in case there are questions for you from the public. Again, I'm very grateful that you were all um, able and willing to join us um, this afternoon and for your clarification. I hope that we have. Um, uh, reached a point where the commission is now clear on how this project is proceeding. Um, with no further questions from the commissioners, we can turn to the public if there are any questions or comments. We do have one person with their hand raised. Caller, I'm going to unmute you. You have three minutes to comment. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Soper. I'm with the National Voting Rights Task Force. And I, I have a couple comments. You know, I'm glad that this phase two is going to be altered, but we don't know into what. But one of my comments is if I look at the uh, homepage for the Bay Area URC, they said they're concerned they're supposed to be dealing with catastrophic disasters in terrorism. So what are they doing with elections? They don't belong there and they don't know what they're doing. I mean, when I say they don't know what they're doing, you would know anybody who knows California election law knows that internet voting is illegal, flat out illegal. So why bother starting? And then the other thing is why does it take many months 
for the Elections Commission to find out about this and for the Registrar of Santa Clara County and for the Registrar of Sonoma County who did not know about this until a few weeks ago. This thing was being done in secret behind the public's back and behind the back of the Elections Commission. And we're going to have to watch this because we can't trust you. That is a real problem. So um, that is about it. But this was yeah, clearly about internet voting and trying to say it's not is not right. Uh, they're talking about secure return of ballots. That's internet voting, period. So it's one, internet voting where it's illegal in the state and two, Bay Area Uwasi does not have a mandate to be dealing with this. We have plenty of people, including an elections commission, who do. So I will thank you for listening to my comments and uh, happy holidays. Thank you, Mr. Soper. We do have another caller. Caller, I will unmute you. It's the 650 number. You have three minutes to comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara Simons. I, I live in San Francisco, um, and I I'm a computer scientist. I'm also a member of the Board of Advisors of the Election Assistance Commission, appointed by um, originally appointed by by Harry Harry Reid and reappointed by Senator. Um, I want to second the previous comments. This proposal was, in fact, internet voting, whether or not it was called that. Uh, and there's consensus in the security community com that internet voting is fundamentally insecure. We cannot do it securely now. Uh, if this hadn't been caught, if it had gone forward, and internet voting had somehow been implemented in the greater Bay Area, it would have opened a Pandora's box for a lot of people who would like to impact our elections in ways that we may not like. So my question is, given that this was in fact internet voting, again, independent of what it was called, independent of blockchains or whatever, it was internet voting, why was there no consultation done with the wealth of expertise in the Bay Area? I mean, we, we are the center of technology expertise. You could have brought in many experts on cybersecurity and voting online or not voting online, which we shouldn't be doing, and had, had to be. So why was that not done? Thank you, caller. I, she seems to have hung up. I haven't hung up. I just oh, asked my question. Right. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, I and my question is why why was why was there no consultation with experts on cybersecurity and internet voting and in fact the dangers of internet voting, given that that expertise is right in your backyard? Why was that not done? Thank you, uh, thank you, Barbara uh, Simons. Um, I don't know if any of the uh, members of the team that were involved in actually working on this want to respond? Sure, I just didn't understand the process. So do, do you want us to go ahead and do you want to do public comment first and then have us respond or, or do we? Let me take the other callers then if you've sure. got that question. Great, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zamora. Let's take thank the you. other callers. Okay. Mr. Turner, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, and thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Brent Turner. Um, I am an advocate for uh, voting rights in the United States and work um, uh, fervently with uh, many notables in the arena, uh, specifically former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Jim Woolsey, and uh, I want to concur with the previous caller. Um, there is a tremendous amount of expertise available. Interestingly, on this issue of internet voting, the um, answer is fairly simple that you just avoid it completely uh, because there is no way to secure an internet voting application. Uh, luckily, this particular project was discovered. Uh, I think. Uh, Th through the good efforts of Commissioner Jordanic, and that 
is interesting because in your midst, you have a person that is in the top one half of 1% of the people in the world understanding the modern technology issues surrounding voting in general. So it's a brand new world here. Unfortunately, in our efforts with the DHS and our conversations, they have not necessarily demonstrated the expertise requisite uh, for moving forward without added consultants involved and uh, spending money unwisely, regardless of a timeline, is, is not a good idea. I think uh, Commissioner Jordanik should be involved in any rescoping. And again, I just want to applaud this commission and uh, Supervisors Walton and uh, Haney for, for nipping this in the bud, basically, and hopefully any available monies go toward the open source technology project that San Francisco has been pushing for for so many years. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Mr. Turner. And then I believe there's one, a, a few more, at least one more caller. Yes, Mr. Jefferson, I will unmute you. You have three minutes to comment. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just want to agree with, uh, with the comments previously made by especially Jim Soper and, and Barbara Simons. And I just want to emphasize two angles on it that they have already said. One is that this was a proposal for internet voting, no matter what other terminology was used. And we're seeing this more and more. The term internet voting has a kind of negative connotation to it in the, in the elections world today. So those who promote internet voting always find some other term to describe it as, for example, electronic return of voted ballots or something like that. It's internet voting plain and simple, and uh, it has to be recognized as such. And the second thing I want to emphasize that they also said is there is no way to secure internet voting, any kind of internet voting. It is not a solvable problem with any technology available now or in the foreseeable future. Um, no matter how uh, uh, well spoken the advocates are for um, internet voting systems, uh, and no matter how much they claim, and no matter how, how many security properties they claim, uh, they cannot defend against every kind of attack that we know of. There just are no defenses against a lot of it, the attacks. So we just have to draw a line and say, no matter what the purpose is, um, uh, we cannot uh, implement internet voting in this, in this country, or for that matter, in any democratic country in the world. It's a danger in every country in the world. And, uh, we have to say no to this. Um, we're all supportive of, of uh, all kinds of other ways of supporting disabled voters, but not this way. Um, so thank you very much for your, for your time and happy holidays. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Are there any other callers? I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, so um, having heard from the public, uh, there are, Questions specifically, I, I think, to Mr. Zamora, and perhaps uh, if any of the other guests, Mr. Dietick, uh, Ms. Kaplan, or uh, Ms. Jarrell want to chime, chime in as well, that'd be great. Mr. Zamora? Sure, uh, Commissioner um, uh, Bernholtz, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, just kind of respond through you. Um, you know, I, th I think the, the thing I want to, we, we would want to state here, um, speaking to the project uh, or like the inception itself, is that um, the Bay Area UASI does not determine national priority projects. That comes from that comes from the federal government. So, in order to receive the uh, the full grant award for the Bay Area, which goes to any number of people in these projects, we have to we we have to have projects. We have to uh, basically conduct projects which the with which the federal government um, states as national priority projects. So in this case. Um, the, the the Department of Homeland Security indicated that election security was a national priority project, and that in order to receive the grant, uh, the full grant for 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 the entire barrier, we had to uh, we we had to spend money on a project. Now, as uh, General Manager Gizek stated, we are not elections experts, 
And so we consulted with um, regional work groups, which included you know, some of our, our partners that are here today uh, about you know, what projects they may have available. I also do want to note that um, you know, as, as, as general manager, Jesus mentioned, this was all happening during San Francisco's COVID response. And I will say, Greg, sorry, I know I took a lot of your staff to the EOC with me to, to, to be able to do that. So it's, it's not something that, um, that your, your team was able to spend a lot of time on. And so um, that was that 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 was part of what was going on here as well. Um, again, you know, I think we can um, looking at looking at the project, looking at the timeline, also understanding the 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 the, the, the confusion around it um, and the feelings around it. We can accomplish a project that meets the homeland security priorities while also um, you know uh, help, helping improve access to people with disabilities. We feel like the um, needs and gaps analysis phase will allow us to understand more from the region about what is needed um, for people with disabilities in terms of increasing their um, their access to 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 voting. Thank you. Um, any other of our guests want to add to Mr. Zamora's comments or let me just leave it at that. Yes, uh, I'd like to add to the comment and put it put everything into a, a perspective. When we look at this project, let's look back in time in 2020. The NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity was released in, in February. We had an approval authority that oversees the entire regional grant in March. During that release, we have a, a cyber resilience work group that meets on, on a quarterly basis. We went to the cyber resilience work group and we said, hey, we have this project and, and we have a mandate to fund a national priority project under soft targets and crowded places. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, warning in that area that was mandated. We didn't come up with an internet project. This is nothing about online voting. This is about a mandated project from Department of Homeland Security. We went to a, a work group, a regional work group who we uh, meet on occasion that has partners, not just in San Francisco, across 14 jurisdictions. And what we were looking at is a project that can satisfy the requirements of the mandate in a timely and, and, and fashionable uh, period. These national priority projects get reviewed, scrutinized by both Cal OES and they get scrutinized by the Department of Homeland Security for effectiveness. They look at budget, they look at whether it is regional and whether it meets a gap in needs of the community. Uh, DT is, has been working with us on a lot of cyber security projects. They mentioned that there is a project that they're working with the mayor's office on disabilities to, uh, to uh, make voting more accessible for the folks that have disabilities for access and functional needs. That we've asked the, the region whether or not that would fit the bill, and we we uh, they all agreed that this would be a project, a regional project. We brought it to the approval authority within one month from the notice of funding opportunity, and it was approved. It was approved unanimously. It had nothing to do with online voting. That is a false negative, um, and it is it is it, it equates to some like conspiracy theory that has groundless and lacks factual uh, substantiation. It is all about uh, meeting the requirements of, of a mandate from the Department of Homeland Security and to, uh, and to close and assist the, um, the folks with disability in this process. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. I, I uh, appreciate that perspective. And of course, it, um, I, I think everyone on the uh, speaking for myself, I won't speak for the other commissioners um, are, are very cognizant of the demands uh, on all city and, and government departments uh, at the time period you're talking about. I do believe, however, 
that the references that this commission has focused on to both internet voting um, and blockchain voting um, are drawing on text that was included in the RFP. Um, so recognizing the important distinctions that were being drawn by some of the members of the public, um, there are direct references in, in the RFP to, to some of this language. So, um, however, I see Director Jarrell has appeared on the on the screen. So if there's more that you wanted to add, Director Jarrell, happy to hear from you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Linda Jarrell. Um, I want to take you back even further in time. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> For giving me that opportunity to to go way back in time, so let let's talk about July of, of 2019, and as we were working, one of the one of our one of our um, tasks that we did when we were working on the open source voting project was to engage with our community, to engage with the public, to have a public meeting, and to really get that feedback from the public about. Um, their thoughts about open source voting, their ideas, and at our meetings, I think there was one, there might have been two, I'd have to look back, 30% of the people that were there were disabled. They were there because they had such a overwhelming need for help. I was shocked. I had no idea that there was such a need in the community we do know that there are 90,000 disabled people in the city of San Francisco. And to have people come out to an evening meeting to attend in person, make that effort to come to One South Van S, and for 30% of the people at the meeting to be disabled and wanting to talk forever about how difficult it was for them to vote independently really came home to us. So, with that as a wake up call, if you will, eyes wide open. It was in September that elections and the mayor's office of disability and DT reviewed the results of that meeting and talked about why they were there. Talked with the mayor's office of disability on all the different needs. Why it's so important that they're able to vote independently and without somebody's assistance. And with me um, at that meeting was um, the city's uh, chief information security officer. And we thought, well, a lot of the, what they're telling us is around security and is around their identity. And you all, whether you know it or not, use identity management technology all the time if you do online banking. What, it, what this is, is it's two factor authentication to validate someone's identity. You can do it, of course, with a text message. You can do it with a pin. You can do it with questions. You can do it with hardware. And we had even looked at some technology that's just a little hardware key that somebody would have that would allow them to prove their identity, right? So, this is why it seemed to be the very first baby step, and I mean a baby step, in trying to help and facilitate more independence for our disabled residents as they would try to use any sort of um, voting assistance tool, any sort of the current online system that they have to do voting. Um, at some, you always have to start with your identity. So we were trying to at least provide a step forward. And of course, in San Francisco, um, our identity and access management team is expert in this technology. We have over 100 applications behind our identity and access management system. It is used by over 60,000 employees, retirees, um, contractors, et cetera vendors that work with the city. So we are very well aware of, of how to implement this technology correctly. So as Craig mentioned, when we learned that there was this requirement for the federal UASI funding to have something about soft targets, elections and security, we thought of our work 
and the comments that we had received from the community back in July of 2019. And we wrote a five line overview of what an identity and access management little project could be that would start the conversation and the work towards helping disabled voters be more independent. So I point you also to history and a report that I prepared for this commission back in July of 2020, where I described this very project. I described it in, in detail in a report that was submitted to the commission regarding the status of our open source voting project. I talked about what we had accomplished, the community outreach that we had done, our strategy, the, the deliverables, our risk limiting audit and proof of concept that was successful. And then I talked about remote vote by mail for residents with disabilities. And I talked about the fact we had met with the mayor's office of disabilities, how to improve election access. We have the majority of our comments from residents that have disabilities. And then I outlined our open source voting program for FY 2021 and 21 22 budget years and noted that we had to reevaluate our priorities because of COVID, that our funding had been reduced, but that we felt we could continue the open source risk limiting audit project and the remote vote by mail identity and access management. And I talked about identity security and some of the engineering thoughts. And a lot of this was just brainstorming, no decisions, no engineering, no anything more than just the concept of what the component would be and what the goal would be, which is identity management for them to be able to identify and and how those sorts of things would interface with disability tools. So the, this commission was aware of this concept, this little effort, this need back in July of 2020. So that's right in line with when UASI was making funding decisions and move forward decisions. And I, I want to stop right there and just say how surprised we were that we were approved. The Department of Technology has a history of applying for UASI projects. In fiscal year 18, we put in a proposal for cyber for the cyber resilience working group for um, some training programs, and it was not approved. In 19, we proposed a alerting system technology. It was not approved. Also in 19, we worked with the um, local area cybersecurity team and the UASI team on project ideas, doing a survey. Out of that came mobile satellite trailers for emergency internet connectivity. That project was approved and the Department of Technology managed that project and we have the trailers in um, available for use. In 20, FY20, we put in for, we requested from UWASI and proposed a project for regional cybersecurity governance model. It was not approved. We proposed regional virtual security operations center proposal. That was not approved. And then we proposed or contributed to the election security for disability disabled um, CCSF community and that was approved. And in 21, I don't know where this one stands, but we have put in for a regional framework for vendor cyber risk assessment. So we continue to as a Department of Technology, in charge of security, cybersecurity for the city, we continue to work with UWASI on emergency um, projects that will help the entire city and region. 
We look for tools. Of course, we have the cyber expertise to propose projects that improve cybersecurity for the region. We are a leader in the region for cybersecurity. So you'll see that the fact that this project was approved came as a big surprise. We were very excited about it. We felt we could do a small step forward to um, move the conversation forward. And I love the idea that it has a phase one of, of doing needs assessment. That would have been where any project needed to start with any sort of technology is to understand the needs, how we would interface with accessibility tools, how to make voting easier for and independent for the disabled community. So I think the way the project's phased now is all good. It's all good. And I'm certain that there will be some um, real measure of accomplishment and learning out of this project. So um, you know, we're here to support the project. We'll be one of the members. We hope to um, be able to contribute in any way we can. Um, and I just wanted to remind everybody what some of the history and, and how this really came about. Thank you. Thank you, Director Durrell. Um, uh, Ms. Kaplan, uh, is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you so much for joining us and for providing uh, your uh, memo on this subject as well. Oh, you're very welcome and, and thanks for um, the opportunity to um, contribute to your decision making here. Um, I don't have much to add to what Linda just um, went over and um, I'm certainly not able to speak to um, the technical approaches that might be used to implement some of the goals of the project, but I just wanted to um, reinforce and talk a little bit about uh, the phrase that Linda used, because it's really, really important for people with disabilities, and that's the ability to vote independently. Mm -hmm. um, when many people um, in the public think about people with disabilities, they generally think about, oh, well, they need help. And um, if we're going to address the issue of voting, then we'll just get people to help them vote. And what's wrong with that? Um, I probably don't need to get into responding to that much to the Elections Commission, but obviously um, people want to be able to vote without having others know what what vote they're making, what decisions they're making about mm -hmm. who to vote for. Um, and often people with disabilities rely on um, family members or others who might try to influence them in a way that they don't want. Um, so um, that's an issue that we hear about frequently. And we also hear that um, there's a strong need for better solutions that will provide people with that degree of independence, whether um, they have physical disabilities, um, sensory disabilities, um, and um, need to be able to um, take advantage of technology to provide the level of independence that people, all people should be able to take for granted especially when voting. And that's why the Mayor's Disability Council supported this project and why MOD has been involved in it because it is probably one of the top priorities for the community. And of course, um, the um, community cares about security as well, mm -hmm. um, just as much as most people do. So, um, Thank you again for uh, your consideration of these issues and figuring out, hopefully we can get all of us thinking about how to uh, achieve both goals at the same time. Fabulous, thank you so much, yes. And thank you, um, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for all you do. And uh, in particular, I do uh, hope that as the project proceeds in its revamped form, 
that is um, the community of people with disabilities that will benefit from these new purchases. Um, we have uh, some more callers back on the line. I know this is slightly out of um, order here, but let me turn to the commission first, see if there's any other comments or questions from commissioners. Commissioner uh, Mogi. Yeah, thank you um, for everyone for participating. I think, you know, just hearing um, everyone's feedback um, from, um, you know, Miss Miss Deborah um, Kaplan to Francis um, Zamora and Linda Jarrell and and everyone else on the team. It was it's been it's you know it just shows that. Was he going with you? Oh, sorry. Apologies. It's okay. Um, it. Now it makes a lot of sense why there was a lot of confusion. Um, and, you know, I, I understand that even the public's kind of like frustration of maybe it was really um, done, you know, behind the scenes or whatnot. And I know that that was not the intention. And we've all been experiencing a lot of shifts in our role in city government due to the fact that, you know, there we've been experiencing a, a major pandemic as well and still trying to address the needs. Um, I agree with um, Ms. Kaplan that, you know, I just want also the public to know that, like, I think during the conversation of open source voting and to see so many people from the disability community come out and figuring out how maybe this is the opportunity for them to receive more access and, and, and you know, fairer ways for, and easier ways for them to be able to vote. I think that does show the tremendous need in elections right now that is still where we have the gap. I do also believe that in order to do it right, I think the confusion, and I was reading all the RFP language, it does come off like the priority would have been towards, or the, the intention was to think through the process of through, um, you know, online voting or whatnot. And, and I'm hearing today that that's not the only solution and we should be really working together. Um, at the end of the day, just because it makes it easier um, does not mean that it's safer. And I think that what our goal together is to be able to do it safer um, and with uh, much more access. And so I do want to emphasize that. And, and I think that also even in um, the discussion around, you know, I've been around for a little bit and hearing about open source voting um, and, and the disability community coming out. I do think that that was a very kind of uh, like, I would say it was really important for us to to start paying attention to it. And again, if even if there was some request that was, you know, that was like um, a priority done by the Department of Homeland Security or everything else, like if it's not done properly and if it's not just done in an engaging way, we could just be going moving backwards if we're not, you know, hearing all the inputs. And so I do appreciate the public coming out to be able to kind of emphasize, you know, this looks alarming and then for us to look into it and for us to have this conversation. Um, I, I hope that it's not a, a sense of like, you know, stalling or anything, but I think, you know, it's, I hope that for all of you that have been able to work with this commission, we are always intentional of making sure that we can still run the safest and best election here. And so I do believe that we are a place that we can problem solve together. Um, I, I'm kind of, I do feel, I do feel, I want to just emphasize and say, like, I do genuinely feel the public's kind of reading all the language without being, um, you know, any real public, like from a public's perspective, a public discussion around it, why there is a lot of confusion. And so I appreciate everyone coming out today to kind of share um, how the process has, has been. Um, I just, I will just like kind of point out that, you know, when these meetings happened in 2019 around open source voting, it was around open source voting. If there were other things that came out, um, just because it was included in the same memo, like it, and but it was going a different direction, like it, it's that 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 in itself is a little confusing in process. So I just wanted to point point that out, and hopefully we can better the communication in the future. It's more of a comment. I didn't have a question. Thank you, Commissioner Mogi. Uh, was there another? Commissioner, yes, Commissioner Jernalink. So, um, yeah, thank you everyone for the, for the, the additional comments. Um, I had 1 question for, um, Mr. Zamora, but I, but before I got to the question, I just wanted to. Ask Ms. Kaplan, um, 
so we are in the process of exploring doing a um a pilot next november of a of an accessible ballot marking device and the nonprofit that we're contemplating working with is interested in in um doing some user testing of some more advanced features of um using a ballot marking device to mark a paper ballot and um i know you know they want to actually work with members of the disability community to kind of see if we can move closer towards the goal of allowing people to vote independently. So I want to ask you um, who would be the best contact person at your office if to engage you in that process? Please um, contact me. Okay. And I'll make sure that we um, get you in touch with people. I think, you know, in general, the disability community likes to be involved in user testing um, in order to make sure that things really work. So, um, sounds good. Yeah, and they're, they're right here based locally. So, um, I think Great. there's a lot of opportunity there. Thanks. So, um, my question for Mr. Zamora is, um, on, in terms of the phase 1 gaps and needs analysis, it's kind of a 2 part question, but number 1, what would be the best way for, um, us as a commission to be informed of the result of that analysis? And also, if there's a community component to it, and I don't know if there is, what would be the way for people to get involved in that phase? Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, gosh, sorry, sorry, apologize. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Jordanic. Um, and so, thank you for that question. These, so, the need, the phase one needs analysis will include engagement with uh, local government entities across the region, but also with the with, with people within the disability community. And so, uh, once we have a contractor on board who can conduct that um, needs and gaps analysis, there will be some additional outreach conducted to ensure that we hear voices about what is what is needed to make voting more accessible or, uh, and more independent for people with disabilities. And, and then the other part of the question was getting informed of the result of the analysis. Um, sure. So what? What I believe is there's going to be a strategy report that's going to be, um, con uh, well, I think this, that is going to be part of that needs analysis that will be uh, released to the 14 jurisdictions within the urban area security initiative. And so I would imagine that would also include people, local government aid entities that we engaged with. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Zamora. Any other comments from commissioners? Uh, since we've, we have our guests here and, um, we have our members of the public and also in the interest of time, uh, secretary Douglas, do ask you just to uh, take these comments from the. 2 people with their hands up. See if there's any questions specifically for our guests, and then we'll be able to let, um, everyone move on. Okay, I'm un unmuting Mr. Turner. You're unmuted. Yes, commissioners, thanks again uh, for taking another round of comments. I'll be very brief. I appreciate it. Commissioner Mogi's uh, comments um, and wanted to add that this event did not happen in a vacuum. Um, there has been a track uh, record history here of some resistance to the open source voting project that has been germ uh, germinating here for um, 15 years or so in San Francisco County. There's been basically a resistance to the directions coming from the supervisors saying move forward with open source voting as fast as possible. And, you know, we just haven't done that. And now I think we've seen nationally that we're in a danger zone because obviously the winner uh, isn't necessarily as clear as the winner could be for an election if we had better systems. So we want to make what we consider good systems, which we're utilizing now, even that much better. And the fact that we shortchanged the open source project a bit by shifting some money away, and then the money went toward risk limiting audits rather than what we thought was necessary at the time, building out a system. And then this thing came in. Luckily, of course, now we've got a nonprofit that came to us with a gift system to save the day. But the rest of the history here is is concerning. 
And so, again, I just appreciate this commission staying on top of it. And I would encourage all the stakeholders in this meeting and others to really do a deep dive into this subject matter uh, with good guidance from Commissioner Jordanic. Get familiar with who's who and what's what, but the disability community historically has been uh, in lockstep with the open source community, understanding that being confined to just a couple of vendors or one vendor is not best practice. We want to open the market up and give uh, you know a chance for this better technology and better turnaround times with upgrades, and that is in essence, the open source voting movement. So again, you're all appreciated. This is pioneering stuff and it's not simple, but I think the answers are available if we just take time to really delve deep when making our decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Jefferson, I will unmute you. You have three minutes to comment. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, when I spoke the last time, I failed to introduce myself. I, I am a computer scientist also, uh, like Barbara Simons, and have been studying these these issues of voting for over 20 years now. So I do understand these technical issues. Um, I was happy to hear that um, that the core of this project, as it was outlined, is really identity management, and that one application that that was mentioned, and perhaps people had more or less interest in was uh, identity management for purposes of remote voting uh, to, to, to aid the disabled. I just want to say that I, I think the studying of identity management for all kinds of remote transactions that a citizen might have with a city is a terrific idea. There are lots of transactions involving, I don't know, taxes or zoning or um, many other ways that citizens uh, interact with, with government um, for which a, uh, a remote identity management is, is a very valuable uh, thing to have. But I wanna make it clear that voting is completely different in its requirements for privacy and security from all of the other kinds of routine transactions that one might engage in with the city. Um, and identity management is only one of a dozen or two dozen foundational security problems. Uh, and if you had a perfect solution to identity management, you would not be any closer to being able to conduct a secure election. So what I would like to recommend is that, yes, by all means, uh, go forward with the study of uh, identity management, but just strike all discussion of voting uh, as an application for that identity management, because it's just, it's not, sufficient and and won't be. Um, I also understand the importance of, of engaging the disabled community in the discussions of remote transactions and in the discussion of uh, their needs for voting. But when it comes to voting, you you must not just engage with the disabled with the disability community. You have to also engage with the security community who has been looking at this for 20 years, typically longer than the disabled community has. And of course, we actually understand what the foundational problems are, which uh, the disabled community may not. And of course, we, I understand, don't all understand all of the issues that they face either. But you have to talk to both, uh, both kinds of communities, not just, uh, not just one. That's my, that's my recommendation. So um, thank you for listening to me. A second time, and I, I really enjoyed hearing these comments. I realize I'm on mute. Thank you to Mr. Jefferson. Thank you again. Unless I don't think there's any other questions or comments from the commission, I want to thank Mr. Zamora, Mr. Dijic, um, Ms. Durrell, and Ms. Kaplan for joining us. Um, this has been very, very helpful. Um, it seems to me one thing for the elections commission to keep in mind now and in the future um, is that the Department of Homeland Security has added elections into this category, and we might do be well served by keeping our eye on uh, all local uh, departments that interact with that federal department. But that's discussion for another time. Um, I think we are ready to move on to the next item. 
uh, right. there's no action to be taken here. Actually, um, so I'm yes. sorry, President Bernholz, I'm, I will go ahead and uh, switch over the the presenters to attendees now, just so everyone okay. knows. Thank and you. thank you again to all of you for attending. Have a happy holiday and um, take good care of yourselves. Um, item number six is the election plan. Thank you, Director Arntz. Um, this is discussion and possible action on the proposed election plan for the consolidated special municipal election on February 15th, 2022. Um, and the election plan itself was included in the packet and um, uh, is on the website for the public. Uh, I have several questions, but I'll ask uh, my fellow commissioners, or actually, let me first ask, thank Director Arntz for preparing yet another uh, incredibly clear and comprehensive um, plan. And um, if you'd like, if there's anything you'd like to say as a uh, means of introduction. Thank you, President Bernholz. Uh, yeah, a lot of work went into this plan. I, I, I think folks in the department deserve a lot of uh, praise of myself, actually, for their input. Uh, just just a few items. I think the plan does a good job indicating how the department's essentially simultaneously conducting several elections through the next uh, several months. And also need to draw attention to the fact that uh, we will have a consolidation of polling places for the February election. We'll have 314 polling places rather than 588. Uh, state law allows the consolidation of polling places when there's a special election. And this will also allow us to transition to a potential April election because we, we won't have to uh, employ all the equipment for February as we move in to, to April. Otherwise, I don't think we could we could run both elections. And also we have to think about the June election. So uh, then also we we are install we'll, we will hopefully uh, soon with the assistance of the Department of Public Works uh, begin installing uh, 34 ballot drop off boxes throughout the city. Uh, that's something new, and it's required by a new by Assembly Bill 37, uh, which I think mm -hmm. passed in September, August and September, and it applies to all elections in 2022. Most jurisdictions don't have elections in February, uh, but since we do, we have to accelerate the, the, the implementation of this. There's been a lot of uh, time and planning in the department around these ballot drop-off boxes. Uh, we do have sites that we intend to install the boxes, but I will say too that none of the, none of the locations are permanent. Uh, so if people you know don't like a box or boxes, uh, we can have that conversation uh, go, go going forward. But for February, we have to have the, the, the location set and have the boxes installed by January seventeenth. Uh, also, the the election plan provides a, a good map on the location of the polling of the consolidated polling places. Uh, you know, we try to, as much as possible, have polling places in sites that people know, rec centers, libraries, schools, uh, locations like that. That we also, you know, applied factors such as uh, areas where there's a high, uh, high percentage of, of vote by mail voting. Uh, so if there's a lower uh, use of vote by mail voting, we tend to have a, a polling place in those areas. Also, where people require language assistance, we uh, we didn't try to consolidate the polling places as much. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the items I'd like to draw about the election plan. I can take your questions now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, other commissioners, questions for Director Arns, Commissioner Jordanik, and then Commissioner Mogi. Uh, thank you, Director Arns, for an excellent plan. Um, my one question is about the. Um, what is the process like for selecting the drop off locations? So it's actually explained in the in the plan itself. So if you go to page 17, I think. Page 17, okay. I don't yeah. know. Just okay. 17 and 18. Yep. Yeah, so if you go to the page 17 there at the bottom of the page, we so there's there's two Two uh, sets of criteria that were applied. One was the criteria applied for setting locations for voting centers in the Voters Choice Act. And the second criteria was uh, applied by uh, the Center for Inclusive Democracy, uh, where they added more elements such as population density and geography, uh, proximity to public transportation, elements like that. So uh, we combined all those elements and, and also looked at what uh, locations were available to us. I mean, primarily 
we thought that we had better chance of having a box installed at an existing public site, public facility than we did where there was no public facility uh, available. Uh, so most of the sites are, are rec centers, libraries. Uh, then we also have like uh, San Francisco General is a site, but but they're all mostly uh, public locations where where people uh, would have access to the boxes, uh, either geographically or through, through transportation, but also you know again language assistance and and turnout by mail turnout numbers. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Mogi. Thank you, Director Arndt, um, for this uh, yet another great um, election plan. I also just had a similar question around the, the drop off location. Um, is it accurate to say that all libraries will have them? Because it looks like a lot of them, but were there some that couldn't install? Yeah, I, I don't know which ones don't, but Libraries are one of the main sites that we've identified as good places for these boxes, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head which ones don't have boxes. Okay, it's just it, it was just more from like thinking of from, you know, letting the public know like what is the easiest way. Like it is still confusing when you're like, well, one if there's a map, but if people just already knew, like I can go to my local library, like. I think it's just much easier, but if there are ones that don't have it, then I think it's just harder to kind of let the public know. Um, the map is great at the same time, like, you know, I just think like people think of it in a very simple way. Like, where can I go? Like, that's why, like, always like, oh, I can go to city hall, like, no matter what, whenever it was like a really easy thing to tell people. Um, and to tell the public uh, and voters, like, so, but if it's not every library, then. It, it'll be a little bit tougher to share, um, but I guess we could say most libraries then. So, yeah, mo mo I think most libraries do have boxes, but not all libraries are good locations for boxes. You know, it, yeah, it might, be, it might be the sidewalk doesn't have the the width or or the the capacity to to contain a box. Um, but certainly, li libraries were the main sites that we focused on in trying to locate these boxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just thinking of what would be like the easiest way. Like, I think it's just harder to explain to friends or like whoever is voting to be like, yeah, it's at most libraries and then you can find them at actually some parks. Like, you know, so I was just thinking like, what's the easiest way to do it? But maybe we just do have to kind of simplify it in, in a way. Um, but okay, thank you. Dr. Jung or Chapel? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Uh, Director Arns, thank you for the comprehensive plan. It, based on my read, it looks like the two kind of challenges for this particular election are really the overlapping election cycle and kind of ongoing challenges with COVID. Is that is that the case? Are there any unique challenges to this particular uh, election that you're trying to solve for? Uh, in no, I mean, in relation to what we've experienced in previous elections, I mean, the having, and we've had elections in close proximity previously, like the November uh, 2019 election, the March 2020 election, when I mean, we were essentially running two elections then, and that was also during COVID, which made things challenging. Uh, here we've got three elections, uh, and the April, the, and the, the, the time difference between April and June is only six weeks, and the, the time difference between February and, and April is, is uh, we've got eight weeks. So uh, we had a bit more. We had about the same amount of time for the March election uh, coming out of November. So it's I mean it's, it's similar that way, but and COVID's still an issue too. And then one concern I guess that we haven't really just we we don't know if it's going to be an issue is hiring people for the election, you know mm -hmm. because we. We have had challenges in bringing enough people into the department to support the election activities. And we've also had challenges recruiting poll workers. Uh, I think partially that's from COVID due to COVID. And also, I think there's other factors involved when it comes to bringing people into the department now. So, but we're not at the point, I don't, I'm not at the point now where we, we know that's going, that is an issue. We're, we're, we're looking at that. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Commissioner Jung, do you have any questions? Oh, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Director Arntz, echoing the thanks of my colleagues. Um, I have some clarifying questions. Um, the consolidated precincts to 314, am I understanding correctly from what you just said that your hope is that those would be the same then, or that that's the same base you start from if there is an April election? So, yeah, so the, the, the polling, so in April, so if there is an April election, that the, the only the voters in Summit District 17 will participate in, in April. Right. Uh, so April. Okay. So if there's no majority winner in the March election or in the February election, right. then there will be an April election. So there actually be less polling places for April, not because we're consolidating more. It's just just over half the city will be will be voting in April. Right. But yes, okay. We do, we do want to have consistent polling places for not only February and April, but also for February, April, and going into June. Uh, and one thing that's in the plan that we, we, we do every election, it's not just because of this, these current cycles. If, a, if, if voters had a polling place uh, for, uh, let's say February, but there's no polling place in April, we'll put a sign yeah. outside the, the previous polling place. So if, if on election day, voters go to a polling place that existed for February, but it's not there, We'll put a sign indicating where the polling place is for April. We'll do the same thing yeah. between April and, and June. So uh, voters are informed of, of when we've changed polling places. Okay, that explains. Okay, because there I read. Okay, there was something I read that didn't make sense yet, but that that was it. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of voting centers this time around, uh, I, I might have missed it. But is there are there voting centers happening, or is it just city hall and the precincts? So we'll have the one voting center in, in City Hall for uh, February, February, April, and June. Okay, but not at, at state or elsewhere. Not, no, not for, the, not for these elections. Okay. Um, the training, which I know when we spoke uh, at the affirmation of the election, there had been some concern that perhaps the online training wasn't um, as good as it could be. And I saw a mention here on page 30 that you'll have both in-person and online training courses this time around. Is that, um, so uh, could you just tell me more about that? And are you, uh, how are you feeling about the ability to address any of the things that came up at the previous election uh, through this expanded training? What looks to me to be expanded training. So we had we had in person training as well for the for the, the November election. Uh, the, the but we most but most of it was uh, online. But some folks don't have access to online training, so we do provide in person training for people to, who don't have access. And we're doing the same thing again for this election. So most of the training for the February election will again September election uh, will again be online, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we, we've, we've looked at our incident reports from, from September. Uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've reconsidered the training that we provided the poll workers in September. We're making changes for the training for, for, uh, February. Uh, but then also, I think. People are more likely to come in to city hall for the equipment, uh, training sessions that we provide there. Uh, okay. which okay. weren't as, as well attended. For the September election, as they have been in the past, so hopefully we can we can draw more people in because that's really where most of the issue is: is people aren't just aren't familiar with with the with the, the voting equipment at the polling places, which generates right. more calls into us, and we have to go and attend those calls. Right. Okay. Um, is there any way to incentivize that? Uh, at the moment, no. We, as yeah. far as cash is concerned, no, we don't have the funding for that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I did, the school board recall election. Does it is it structured the same way? As the, uh, recall recall election for the summer that there's the 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 candidates. It's a vote on the recall, and there's a then a slate of candidates who would replace any recalled candidates. Uh, I appreciate the question. No, and so it, locally it's different. There, it, so it, in San Francisco, voters will have the three recall questions on their on their ballots, 
but they will not see a list of, of replacement potential replacement candidates as they did for the for the recent uh, gubernatorial recall election. Uh, in San Francisco, if a local official is recalled, then the mayor fills the vacancy by appointing someone into that office. Uh, okay. You know, people that whoever is appointed would serve in at the next election occurring 120 days after the, the, the vacancy occurs. So if one, two, or three of the school board members are recalled, those seats would be temporarily filled by the mayor. Given the plethora of election opportunities we have coming up, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh at that. Um, the new candidates for the school board might appear uh, should be one, two, or three in no is it likely that those would appear in November of 2022? Correct. I can't even remember what year it is. Correct. Okay. Um, and my question then is that would require that that, that means then if of the one or more of the school board members are called, you'll be running a special school district election, which includes the um, non citizen voters. At least once, not twice this year. It's, the answer is yes and no. So, in November of 2022, the, the, the Board of Education will be on the ballot anyway. And so, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. And so, so, so whoever serves, whoever is appointed to the vacancy will serve until the November right. 2022 election. And then, whoever is appointed into the vacancy can be a part of, can have their name on the ballot. In November 22, right. they're not precluded for, from from being a part of the election, um, but and yes, non citizen voters will be able to participate in November 2022 election as well, but not not as a special election, but as a scheduled election for Board of Education. Okay, so that's important for me to so regardless of what happens, then actually in February there are two elections in 2022 with non citizen voting. Correct. Right. Perfect. Um, and then uh, I'm sorry, I have two more questions and then I'm done. Uh, I think we talked about this at a previous meeting, but I couldn't find the answer or um, I just missed it. Are the voting boxes wherever they'll be placed? Are there security cameras there? As much as we can, we're, we're locating the boxes where there would be a security camera on the box. Uh, okay. But especially now, as we get move to get these boxes installed, like really in three weeks, uh, not all boxes potentially will have a camera on them full time. Right. Okay. And then my final question, and I appreciate your patience. So, um, I know that there is a set of languages in which voting materials must be provided. Um, and I believe that is the set of languages that you list as being on the, um, both on the ballots, but also on the voting boxes. Um, what is the process by which an additional language would come to the forefront? And here I'm thinking particularly of questions we received during the redistricting process about Arabic language materials. So there's there's two ways that there's there's three there's three ways that there's three methods by which San Francisco provides language. For, for in, in relation to elections, the first is through the results of the federal census, and so if, if the federal census shows there's a, there's a certain percentage, like it's five percent of of a of a of the, of the residents of a city uh, speak a, a a language as a group, then the then the, then by state law we're obligated to provide uh, our material materials and assistance in that language. Uh, and then there's there's a, a a state elections requirement that if a if a polling place has uh, three percent or more is, is identified through a, a statewide process using the American what's the, the American survey from the from the Census Bureau uh, if if it's three percent or more within a precinct then we provide language mm -hmm. assistance and then the city mm -hmm. has, has a language uh, language access ordinance. And it's it's in the season language access ordinance is 10,000 people or more who are identified as a speaking uh, mm. language. Uh, they then they would also be uh, provided assistance uh, through city services. 
So in the federal level, uh, for, I just there was information the Secretary of State's office just issued. Uh, San Francisco will not be will not be required to provide an additional language based on the census. Now, as far as the three percent at a polling place, if the American Survey that the Secretary of State's office that they crunch the numbers from the American Survey, if they if they view if they see that a polling places precincts have three percent or more, then the Department of Elections will provide language assistance at the polling places that are identified mm -hmm. uh, with those with those languages. Then the language access ordinance, uh, I believe they probably use the American Survey or or the just the census data. Uh, the city would require all city agencies provide language assistance uh, to people that to to the group that's ten thousand or more that speak a, a common language other than English. Got it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, uh, I have no oh, uh, commissioner Jordanic, please. I just have a couple of questions about the funding of the elections. Were all the, the elections because I believe something went before the board very recently. Is that correct? Was that for all of the elections or just one of them or? No, so yesterday, uh, well, actually last week, the, there was a supplemental appropriation. Heard at the budget and finance committee for February and March. And, and the that was recommended for approval. And then yesterday at the board, uh, the board approved eight million of the of the nearly twelve million dollars that we need to uh, fund February and March. Uh, the three point two five million dollars was was not provided for in the supplemental appropriation because that's the expected amount that the school district would need to reimburse the city. For conducting the three wow. recall elections, uh, Supervisor Mandelman, I think some other supervisors had proposed that the city fund the school district's costs for conducting the recall elections, and that's and our and our supplemental appropriation request was based on the city funding the school's cost for the recall elections. But then yesterday, the board decided, at least at that point, not. To fund the school district's re, uh, portion of the reimbursement for the recall elections. Right now, the school district is on the hook to reimburse the city for running the recall elections. Okay, and then when it comes time to ask, like setting aside that issue you just described, when it comes to um, coming up with a number to ask the board for, like what is that process like? Do you just sort of tally things up or are you working with certain people on what they'd be willing to fund? Uh, I mean, our, so our costs, so our costs are, are still based on our, our budget that we, uh, submitted back in February, essentially. So it's the same items that, uh, we, we proposed that we brought to the city for our, our annual budget. So the same categories is the same, the same items uh, are part of a supplemental request. And we just look at what are the costs for the elections that we'll be conducting. So, for instance, we know the the recall the the upcoming consolidated special municipal election, which includes the recall questions. Uh, that's a one card ballot, and so when we when we put our budget together back in last year, January, of uh, or this year actually, 2021, uh, we you know we were planning for one election the fiscal year that was the, the June 2022 election, and we we. We forecast the cost according to a, I think it's a probably a five card ballot. So the costs are different for that for the June election than they are for a February one card special special municipal election. So we just go through the same line items that we did for our annual appropriation and just apply the factors that we're that we'll be experiencing for these special elections. Okay, I guess I'm kind of going back to President Bernholtz's question about the incentives. Like if you're finding like during the year. Like, oh, it's actually a lot harder to recruit people than we, we thought. Are you allowed to maybe go to the board and say, um, I'd like to request this extra money for this because we're having this challenge? Or is yeah, that like we, a good question? We, we could have put that in. Yeah, we, we didn't. We could have put that into the request, but we didn't. Yeah, okay. So I guess for the future, it's might be okay. That's all I, I was asking. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Jordanic. Any other questions from the commission? 
Okay. Uh, are, is there any public comment? I don't see any hands raised. All right, uh, then we need to uh, approve uh, and accept this uh, plan. Uh, can I get a motion, please? Sure, President Bernholz, how do you vote? No, no, I need a motion. Oh, I, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. To approve. Uh, Commissioner Jordanic, is that a motion? I, I move that we approve the election plan. Thank you. Can I second? Seconded. Thank you. Can we take a vote, please? Okay. President Bernholz, how do you vote? Yes. Vice President Jung? Yes. Commissioner Jordanic? Yes. Commissioner Chapel? Yes. And Commissioner Mogi? With five in the affirmative, the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number seven, employee waiver, discussion and possible action on the request from Director Arntz on employee waivers permitting city employees to assist the Department of Elections with consolidated special municipal election period 15th, 2022, and the waiver uh, was attached to the packet. Is there Are there any questions or comments from the commission, Director Arntz, about this? So my question is going fluey, so I can't see if anybody's raising their hand on the screen. <laughs> I don't see any hands, however, no. now that I can see you again. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. A question. Um, so, Director Arnes, just so you, can you just clarify, I think we should other yes. public know too that you're asking us to approve a waiver today for the February 15th, potential April 19th, and for June 7th, correct? Correct. Do okay. we go through why we're asking for the waiver? No, I think it's just important for to emphasize yeah. that so that we don't, you know, like we should just make sure that we let the public know that this and the rest of the commission know that it's for all three. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Bogey. Any other comments or questions? And thank you for, for that, Director Orange. I think that is a wise move. Um, we can take any public uh, comments from the public then if there are any. No, there are no hands raised. All right. Uh, can I get a motion, please? To approve the waiver for the next 3 elections. Motion, uh, motion to approve the waiver for the next 3 elections. Thank you, Commissioner Chapel. 2nd. 2nd. Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Mogi. Call the roll. Commissioner Berholz, I'm sorry, President yes. Berholz, okay. Vice President Jung? Yes. Commissioner Jordanic? Yes. Commissioner Chapel? Yes. And Commissioner Mogi? Yes. Okay, with five in the affirmative, it passes. Great, thank you. Um, item number eight, open source voting, discussion and possible action on the open source voting pilot. And I'd note that um, attached to the packet was the um, Ordinance for the Board of Supervisors uh, drafted by Deputy City Attorney Flores um, and worked on all this time by uh, Commissioner Jordanic and others. Um, Commissioner Jordanic, is there anything you want to add uh, or draw people's attention to on this item? Sure. Uh, thank you, President Bornholz. So, at yesterday's Board of Supervisors meeting, President Walton did introduce that legislation that is a part of the packet now. And um, during his comments, he uh, he thanked myself and, and Trent Lang and his chief of staff, Natalie G, and attorney Anna Flores and director Arntz. He, he thanked everyone for um, their involvement in this issue. And I also want to thank President Walton for his leadership on this issue and also his chief of staff, Natalie G. She put a lot of time and effort into this over the past um, several weeks or even months. So um, I just want to express my appreciation to them. And um, and yeah, a deputy city attorney Flores, um, she turned this around very quickly. So I think we should all be very appreciative of the work she did. And Director Arns, to you also for for going along with this and working with Voting Works and making quick progress. So um, you know, I personally appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, I think that the legislation it looks great. I mean, I've read it over many times. And um, I did work with um, President Walton's office on the language. 
And um, I think I would love it if we could support it at this meeting. And I, I did draft up a sort of a, a document. It's just a one page. Much it's a much simpler resolution than we adopted at the last meeting. And um, because I think if we have it as a document, they can include it in the legislative file when this um, legislation goes before the committee. But um, I don't know if people have had a chance to read over the text or not, but I'd be happy to explain it or perhaps um, attorney Flores could explain it. If, if people have any questions about what it does, but it's basically along the lines we've been discussing. And the idea would be to have this body take a vote in support of that resolution. So it would be entered into the record. Is that what you're yeah, after? Basically encouraging the board to pass it and, um, yeah, and, and signaling that we support it as a commission. Great. Commissioners, any questions or comments? I think just kind of reiterating, um, I think we've had a very long discussion around this, so I don't think we should be repeating ourselves. So I'm just going to preface that, but um, I'm just, I think I'm echoing what Commissioner Jordanic said is that the, or the ordinance that was introduced, it's, it is fairly, um, it looks, it does look fairly um, brief and, and, and in align in alignment with kind of the, all the conversations we've had and. I would be also be happy to be support to support the resolution as well today. But um, yeah, I just I just want to make sure that I say that because I think we had a very extensive conversation at the last meeting. So, thank you, Commissioner Mogi. Anyone else? I don't see any other hands on the commission. Can we go to public comment, please? Sure. Mr. Turner, I will unmute you. You have three minutes to comment. Uh, thank you, commissioners. And again, uh, thanks to everyone for your continuing leadership to the county and to the country on this issue of open source election systems. It's not easy to pioneer and we uh, folks in the election reform community appreciate uh, all the effort. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple things. Obviously, the public encourages the commission's support of the Walton legislation and encouraging uh, the board uh, to move further is, is a great step here. Um, if no one has caught it, uh, I just wanted to bring forward a bit of news from the federal level, from the national level. There's actually a Republican senator by the name of P Panaccio, and, and he's a New Jersey senator who has now um, moved forward with legislation uh, surrounding open source voting. So the interesting situation we have now, after all these years of, as I think everyone on this commission knows that myself and and uh, Nancy Pelosi's daughter, Christine, were successful in putting open source voting in the Democratic Party platform for California. But now we have some Republican effort moving forward. And I think it's notable that this issue of election system security and modern technology, specifically open source, is creating a bipartisan moment within the country and within the government to say, we don't want to be handing over our elections to corporate software because it's just not as um, modern and secure as the uh, open source technology that you're helping pioneer here. So if you haven't seen that bill, uh, you know, check it out. It's it's Bonaccio. I think I'm pronouncing that right. He's a New Jersey senator, and uh, it all is moving along on many levels. But uh, make no mistake, you're still leading here. The one thing I would say about the uh, the Walton legislation moving forward, we have to be sensitive to making sure that any systems we're dealing with that are purporting to be open source are what's called general public license per the open source initiative. Um, that wasn't in the legislation, but that's okay. 
um, as long as this commission is aware, we don't want any knockoff versions by folks uh, gaming the environment in the future. So I just wanted to make note of that. Hopefully we won't run into it, but if we do, let us say that best practice is a general public license open source paper ballot system. That's the original idea that holds true today. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Any other members of the public? I don't see any other hands raised. All right, so I think we can move forward with a motion to support a resolution that would submit uh, the, what well, the resolution, I'm sorry, the resolution as drafted by Commissioner Jordanic in support of the Board of Supervisors legislation. Can I get a motion? So moved. Thank you. A second. Seconded. Thank you. I, can I, uh, before we take a vote, um, may I interject a question? Yes. Yeah, I uh, just um, <clears throat> may have missed it, but uh, I wanted to offer uh, Director Arntz an opportunity to speak on uh, the proposed legislation and the, the commission resolution, too, if you wanted to do so. Thank you, Vice President Joan. I'm sorry, I'm having all kinds of computer things. So if there's a lag here, it's because I can't see anything that's happening on the screen. So, uh, I go, so I speak. Yes, please. If uh, you have comments. Yes, yeah, thank uh, you. Joan. I, no, I, I'm glad that the, uh, the, I mean, the ordinance sets what the, 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 the scope of the pilot program. Uh, so it's the the one ballot marking device that's at City Hall, uh, possibly two because you can't go over fifty percent of the equipment available at the at the site. So you know we only have one ballot marking device usually at City Hall, so we really can't. Right now we don't we wouldn't plan expanding out much more. Uh, so but it provides the scope of the uh, the pilot program. Uh, it authorizes you know us to go forward with it. So yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's very helpful to have the have the ordinance in place. Thank you, Director Arndt. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? And I apologize again. Now everybody's screen has gone blank, so I'm talking to a blank computer screen. Yeah, so I, I can't see you. This is Commissioner Trudonic. I have a follow-up question. Yeah, Director Arndt, could you also um, let us know if, if there have been any updates on the this item since we last met? On the ordinance? Or just in terms of your own interactions with voting works or um, if you had any, so voting works sent uh, draft use procedures to me. Uh, I made comments. Uh, they sent the, the response back today. I've not had time to look at it today. Um, and I they did also send some information to me. I, don't know if I, I think since the last commission meeting on the contract, uh, I haven't had a chance to work on the contract, so I'll probably have time the next two weeks to do that. Um, so, yeah, so I have received information from voting works. I'll have to look at the use procedures again. And then uh, I did start drafting the, re the request to the secretary of state's office based on the Los Angeles request. So I'll provide that to the commission. Uh, in January, uh, president Bert Bernholz requested last meeting that I do so. So I'll, I'll do that. And then in February, uh, you know, we'll submit the, the the plan to the Secretary of State's office. But prior to that, though, uh, ideally, we'll we'll send the uh, draft, however you want to phrase it, uh, use procedures to the Secretary of State's office. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I just quickly wanted to make a comment um, that I believe um, I. I didn't get a chance to review this um, resolution, um, and I think that it needs an edit. Um, second page, or sorry, it's only one page. <laughs> the finally resolved on, on starting on line twenty. Um, it is. Um, I would amend it to say that the commission requests the mayor um, to urge the secretary or to encourage the secretary of state 
to adopt regulations governing voting systems um, because um, as the um, under Charter Section 3.102, the mayor is the one who is responsible for coordination of all intergovernmental activities of the city and the county. So, you know, we just want to be mindful of that, that if we're urging the Secretary of State to do something that we should likely that we should likely urge the mayor to ask that um, of the Secretary of State as the person responsible for the coordination of intergovernmental affairs. So Commissioner Giordano, any question? Okay. Go yeah, ahead. so Attorney Flores, um, are you suggesting that it read that the commission requests that the mayor join President Walton? Is that or were you saying the mayor and or what were you thinking? Well, so um, you know, so uh President uh, Walton and the rest of the board of supervisors may set city policy, may set city um, with regard to um, state and federal legislation oh. um, if we are if we if our if the intention of this commission is to ask someone in the city to urge the secretary of state to adopt regulations um, I think that the appropriate person to ask that of is the mayor um, okay um, point taken yeah, would you would you mind um, suggesting the language for that beginning of that sentence? Yes. Uh, finally, resolved that the commission requests uh, that um, the mayor um, work with or urge the secretary of state, or maybe work with or urge or encourage the secretary of state. Um, to adopt regulations governing voting system credit programs in time for San Francisco to conduct a pilot during the November 8th, 2022 election. Okay, so how about this? Um, that the commission requests that the mayor encourage the Secretary of State. To adopt, to adopt, regulations. yeah, everything. Yes, because the the, you know, the the two things that are going to stop this legislation, even if it is approved, um, is not having the regulations and also not having our uh, pilot program um, um, adopted or not adopted, um, approved by the Secretary of State. So those are two very important things, and you know, um, under a charter, the the person who is supposed to lead those kinds of intergovernmental activities is the mayor. Yeah. Okay. Um, is everyone clear on that suggested wording? Yes. Okay. Then um, I don't know procedurally if we need to. Can I just accept it as a friendly amendment or something? I'm not sure how that works. Um, who made the resol Who made the motion? Yeah, it's whoever made the motion, right? Yeah, I should just say it as an amended. As as amended by Deputy City Attorney Flores, uh, yeah, Commissioner Mogi, yeah, sure. Um, I would like, <laughs> uh, I um, yeah, with the amend with, I guess the motion with the amendments made by Deputy City Attorney Anna Flores. Is that okay? Yes. I'll re second that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, is there any public? No, there is, we've already taken public comment and there isn't anybody there. Um, okay, can you call the vote, please? You're muted. I know. I couldn't get to it. There was a window in front that opened. I'm sorry. President Bernholz? Yes. Vice President Chung? Vice President John? Yes. Thank you. President, I'm sorry. Commissioner uh, Jordanic? Yes. Commissioner Chapel? Yes. And Commissioner Mogi? Yes. Okay, with five in the affirmative, it passes. All right, thank you. Um, item number nine annual performance evaluation of Director of Elections, discussion and possible action regarding the performance evaluation of the Director of Elections. 
Um, I want to assure everybody, first and foremost, that we're not going to do this today. <laughs> not expected that we will actually undertake this process, um, but it is the end of the year and we are supposed to undertake it. Um, so what I wanted to make sure all of the commissioners had in um, especially Commissioner Chapel, who I don't believe has been through this, was the materials that are part of doing this performance review. Uh, and then I had a question for uh, Director Arntz because it, the process involves both the commissioners. The way we've done this in the past is for each of the commissioners to review Director Arntz uh, on our own. Those are then um, consolidated. Um, but they are also informed by a review that Director Arntz writes, recognizing the chart, which I was on page six of the election plan. Um, I'm not sure when Director Arntz will have a minute to actually work on his report. So I wanted to bring this up in light of the timing for the calendar year, but also to ask Director Arntz um, when you would be most available to work on your own performance review, and we could then schedule our review around that. Uh, are there, are there, is it just for one year or two years that I have to do this? I think I, two years. Of uh, I thought we did this last year and have, in fact, a finalized review for you from 2020. When is that correct, uh, Commissioner Mogi? Do you recall? Yeah, it's right. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I was like, right. no, I I should. I was like, I I promise we did this. So yeah, I did. Yes, we yes. Did it so where it's only one year. It's yeah, okay. just the one year. Okay. It just feels like twelve years. <laughs> it's just been really busy, but we did did talk a lot. I remember because we did talk about you running the COVID election or the pandemic election. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, I don't know if you forgot, but you did great. Uh, and so, um, but yes, I think this is for 2021. I mean, th this, this process seems simpler. I mean, so would, would I respond to these three elements then listed in the plan, the performance plan? Uh, yes. Okay. That would make sense. I mean, I mean, I, we could probably get something out for the, for January's meeting. Oh, okay. If that's possible, then what I would ask the commissioners would be for each of us to review these materials. Uh, we would receive Director Arntz's review in January, and then we will uh, schedule ourselves to both do the to do the individual reviews um, and then have them consolidated for discussion at the February meeting. Does that sound right with everyone? And I think while my camera my screen photos were flipping and going i thought i might have seen someone raise a hand but i'm sorry this is like watching um anyway did someone anyone raise a hand i, I have a question uh President yes uh, so I, I think the i had the same confusion that the director did which is that there so there are two there are two progress reports listed here in this uh this newly updated form one for fiscal year 2020 to 2020, you know, next for 2021 to 2022. You 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 just want him to fill out the second form? Yeah, just for the last calendar year. I think um, we up, uh, uploaded both because that's what Martha found. But yes, just for the 2021 calendar year. It's actually like fiscal year, so I think this is why it's a little confusing. We do the annual reports. If like, we do the annual review at the end of the calendar year, but the. These, these reports look like they're from fiscal year. So I guess that is like, we just need to know which year should he fill out fill out. Fiscal year 2020 to 21 or fiscal year 21 to 22. It probably makes most sense to do the 20 to 21 though. This tool right. hasn't even started. Yeah. Yes. I don't even want to ask this question, but what is I don't even know what that okay. So the fiscal yeah, the, year is. yeah, fiscal year would be June uh a July one of twenty one, and it would end in June of twenty twenty two if you do the twenty twenty two. I know it's a bit so confusing, so maybe we should just use the fiscal year twenty 2020 twenty to twenty one 
um, with Correct. the intent of just talking through the calendar year 21. If yes. That makes sense. Okay. Does that make sense to you, Director Arndt? Yeah, yeah, we can okay. that's fine. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay, so that's the only thing on this agenda item. There was actually, I mean, we can, there's no action for us to take other than to confirm that that's the timeline we're going to work on. Any other questions or comments? Is there any questions or comments from the public? I, I have a comment. Oh, yeah, Commissioner Dijonic. Uh, so for the future, um, if we do have a closed session, I think it's it has been convenient to put it as the last item. Yeah, great idea. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Noted. Thank you very much. Um, there's public comment. Yes. Would you like? Okay, I'll. I'll Mr. Turner, you're unmuted. Great. Uh, thanks again, uh, commissioners. Uh, regarding the performance review, at, at this point, uh, the public uh, isn't so much concerned about Director Arnst uh, now that we're on the right track and things seem to be uh, moving along well. But there is uh, something to be mentioned, and it's not necessarily with his performance. But I uh, and I don't know where exactly this is best placed. But I think the commission should pay attention to uh, some of the media attention around the department, some of the uh, uh, news stories that have come out in local papers. Uh, if, if nothing else, if there's some way to control the current vendor uh, uh, and their representatives, uh, namely Steve Bennett and Dominion, there was a slew of derogatory statements uh, about San Francisco, about the people of San Francisco um, not caring about voting, and that uh, it made it seem like this fellow Steve Bennett basically is running the Department of Elections. So if there's some way to cure that in the future by maybe having Mr. Bennett come in front of this commission um, to explain some of these statements, it seems to be very counterproductive to our efforts to encourage public confidence. And, and I just wanted to mention that I don't think it should be lost in the shuffle here that we've got uh, someone painting the department as basically feckless and smacking of corruption. Uh, these kinds of remarks coming from our current vendor are not helpful, especially when you have the, the uh, newspaper people um, documenting and, and making stories. So um, if there's anything you can do about that, I think that would be appreciated by the public. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Mr. Turner. All right. Are any other members of the public? I don't see any, any other hands raised. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, item number 10, commissioner's reports. Discussion and possible action on commissioner's reports on topics not covered by another item on this agenda. Meetings with public officials, oversight and observation, long range planning, areas of study, proposed legislation. Are there any commissioner reports? I don't see any. All right. Um, I, not, I do not have a report either, other than to note that it was brought to my attention. Um, that the University of California at Berkeley has just named a study commission um, on uh, voting technologies and um, uh, people with disabilities. It's a very interesting commission. It uh, caught my attention for several reasons, up to and including a comment that we've heard from the public several times, in even in this meeting about um, taking advantage of the plethora of technological expertise um, around voting systems. Uh, so I'm not a member of the commission, um, but I plan to keep my eye on what they're working on. There is one colleague of mine um, from the university who is on the commission that I'm aware of. So just to say that that um, is on my radar screen. Uh, if no further comments from the commission, any public comment? 
I don't see any other hands. I'm sorry, I don't see any hands raised. Okay, then we can move to item number 11, the director's report, discussion and possible action on the director's report. Um, Director Orange, thank you uh, for this. Um, I found this to be, as usual, very clear and very helpful um, and proof positive of the enormous load that the department and you are carrying. Um, oh, this is where I saw the numbers, but I didn't understand, but you already answered my question in the previous section. Um, any questions from the commission for Director Orange? Uh. For Director Arntz, is there anything here you'd like to draw people's attention to in particular? Uh, no, thank you, President Burnholz. I think we've covered actually most of it already. Yeah, yeah. I actually, the question I had about the number of polling places was from your report, not from the plan. Um, are there any, I don't see any hands or any questions from the commissioners. <laughs> this is really quite a technology experience here. Um, are there any questions from the public? Comments or questions from the public? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, if no questions from the commission, no questions from the public. Let me just extend my thanks to you, Director Arntz, again for all of your work and for the extraordinary work of the department. Um, there is clearly quite a bit of just managerial um, expertise at work, given the um, uh, timing and number of elections that you're managing. So thank you for that. Um, item number 12, discussion and possible action regarding items for future agenda. So this would be the January 2022 agenda. Um, we will at least expect to see Director Arntz's um, personal uh, performance report comments. Um, any other items people want to ensure get put on this agenda? Commissioner Jordanik. So I, I did want to talk with, with you all about what the public commenter, uh, Mr. Turner mentioned about Steve Bennett. And I would have raised this at the last meeting, but we just were talking about so much. I didn't want to introduce too much, but, um, you know, I, I do think that the comments that. That he made to the reporter and their direct quotes in that article are, are very disrespectful. Not just mm -hmm. to us, but also to to the voters of San Francisco. And I feel like. I, I just feel like it's not something that we should just kind of like let go or act like we didn't see. And I mean, I feel like it would be appropriate for us to ask him to explain himself or, or give him a chance to retract his statements because, you know, to, for the for the person that is representing the company that is selling us voting equipment, for him to say that most people in San Francisco don't care about voting, I mean, I, this just doesn't seem like an appropriate thing for someone in his position to say. So um, I want to like run by you the idea of, of having an item where we um, have a chance to speak with him. Thank you, Commissioner Donick. Any other commissioner thoughts? I actually um, would rather just, I mean, this was, it seems like it was an interaction between Dr. Arns and, and this person. I'm, I'm not a fan of putting someone out in the public and to do this kind of explain yourself situation. It's more of a, a professional discussion that should have between two people that were in that conversation. And I think as a commission, we should emphasize to the, maybe to the director that we, we have a level of professionalism that we would need that, that person to abide by. But like, I, I'm not a fan of calling people out to the public like this. And there's other ways to um, conduct in a professional way that is not in a public setting like this or over an email exchange between two people. And so that that's kind of more my position. Mm -hmm. but, Thank you, Commissioner Mogi. I'm pretty sure that he told the reporter that that's my that was my understanding of of those quotes. But I could be wrong. Um, I mean, would that change things if if he told if he told that to the reporter? I'm just not a fan of calling people oh. out in a public setting like that is over email exchanges or even conversation with a reporter. We're not here to dictate how, like so, what someone does say, but we can actually ask the director to have a, a conversation that's like more 
professional if it was out of line. It's not up to us to police anyone in that way. And I'm just not a fan of doing that in a public setting like that. Yeah, Commissioner Jordanic, may I ask, so which comment in particular was, uh, did, did you view as um, not a conversation between Director Arntz and Mr. Bennett, but a comment well, made to the reporter? Yeah, actually, now that I look at it, it the, the article does say where it came from. So it says, Bennett believes his long relationship with Arntz fills an important need for veteran leadership in a market lacking it. Quote, the Elections Commission doesn't know anything about California elections, Bennett told the examiner. And then it continues, quote, most people in San Francisco don't care about voting. So this is something that he told the examiner, and then the examiner um, included this in his article in the San Francisco Examiner. And this is the man that is selling the voting equipment to our county. And it just, I mean, it's its not the kind of thing that if you're rep representing a company and you're speaking with a reporter, I mean, that's not like a private conversation. It's, so that that was, sorry, that was my quote I was reading. Yeah, I, I you know, I have to say that I, I, I tend to agree with Commissioner Mogi that, um, <clears throat> You know, having, having you know, be, uh, putting people on display doing a performance in the newspapers is, uh, you know, not the best way to do business, uh, and uh, be effective and get things done. And I would also say that, you know, about us too. Uh, but having said that, I think Commissioner Jordanic is right that if this is the case, I mean, no matter what he says or believes about the Elections Commission, that doesn't much bother me that's his opinion but he is our primary elections vendor and if it's true that he told the examiner that most people in San Francisco don't voting that uh that uh undermines I think I mean to me it, it goes to undermining uh faith in uh him as a uh, vendor to this city uh, and uh, that's the that's the that's his purpose that's his company's purpose and that's a, uh, that's a, I agree with Commissioner Jordanic, that is disrespectful to the voters of this city. And I would urge, uh, I would urge the president to invite him and explain himself. Invite him before the committee. Yes. Commission. Oh, we could put that on the January agenda. I, I would agree with uh, Commissioner Mogi that there might be a uh, an alternative way to express our displeasure, um, but I will certainly abide by the issues of the commission. Although this, yeah, I think I might. I my contribution is maybe we should think about what outcome we would want from any interaction. And mm -hmm. let that guide what step we take. So, are we requesting that he do make a retraction? Are we ultimately hoping for some sort of apology on behalf of voters in in San Francisco? I think we should think about what outcome we would like to see, and then that can dictate what our next step would be. I would I would feel more comfortable with that as well. Because based on the outcome, again, like, yeah, like it, if he if he's just like a if he's like very inappropriate and in how he's even interacting as like to represent our you know as our sole vendor and to represent this you know you are going to be wor working with us to represent the city and the voters like he that he should say something but I'm just I'm just not like I just feel like it's a that's just like kind of like just to bring him on to explain himself in a public setting, like unless we're very much structured of what we're going to allow people to like how they want to, how we engage with him or how the public should engage with them. Then I think it's just like completely inappropriate. I don't see a scenario where it's going to be like a productive conversation 
to be honest. And so I would rather us think through what is the outcome we want. Commissioner Dijonic. Well, I would hope that if he came before the commission, he would either say, I didn't say that, or I, you know, I, I would take it back. I, I, I have great respect for the voters. I mean, I, I think it's gives him a chance to, to kind of redeem himself. And also it shows that we're taking seriously the the things that our vendor says about the voters of San Francisco. I mean, I, I think we have a responsibility to um take note of things like this. And I, I don't think it, it doesn't need to be a, a say, I would reiterate and say that there's a lot of ways to get that in a professional way. That's not in these like public settings. And so if the rest of the commission agrees that that should be something that we should do, then we can either take a vote on it, but I'm being very clear that there are other ways to engage. Like that is saying that it's not by me saying he shouldn't come to a, um, a public meeting does not say that I'm not having him take any accountability or responsibility. I just want to be clear about that. Any other thoughts from the commission? I mean, I'm hesitant as as president of the commission. Uh, one option would be for me to contact him and um, ask him directly um, if that was his intention or if he would like to reconsider that statement and you know either retract it or issue an apology to the people of the city and county of San Francisco. I'm hesitant to do that because uh, this is a vendor relationship managed by the department. And so it's definitely something we have tended to try to stay at a policy level about and not actual vendor management issues, which this seems like. That being said, we are also the voice of the people. I mean, I guess in terms of the, to answer the question about what outcome would I like to see, I would like to see him yeah, like issue a retraction or or an apology. I, mm -hmm. I guess it doesn't have to be verbal, but um, well, um, no. Since it appeared in print, it would probably be better if it would appear in print. So, I mean, do we? I guess can we be having this conversation now, or is this like its own? Topic of discussion, I guess what we're. Um, yes, we are on the agenda item for whether or not to put this on a future agenda. We could certainly put this conversation on the future agenda. And then it wouldn't be putting him on the spot. We would just be talking about how to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that's necessary. Do we really need to? That seems kind of circular to me, chasing our own tail to place something yep. on the agenda for the future well, as to whether to place something on the agenda. Well, that's I mean, necessary I'm, to me. no, but I'm saying like, if we, if we want to have the president contact him on our behalf, we need to, we need to vote on that. We can't do it during this agenda item now. We do why? What's because it wasn't agendized at all that we were going to discuss this. If I may, please. Uh, <laughs> I would say that the um, this issue is within the discretion of President Bernholz, um, and to um, allow her to make the decision on how to proceed, um, given that vendor relations are involved and. We don't necessarily control uh, that vendor. Um, and so I think it's this is a conversation that one, I don't agree is um, best discussed in a public forum like this, um, especially if we haven't agendized this item and we haven't given notice to um, the intended, you know, uh, people that are going to be discussed about. Um, and so I think that it is within President Bernholz's discretion 
to think about how the commission wants to respond um, to this and proceed um, and our office is obviously uh, willing to discuss all the options available um, so that those are that's my opinion and um, you know <laughs> take it as you may Thank you very much, uh, DCA Flores. Um, I actually uh, very much appreciate that opinion and would propose that I um, hold conversations with both Director Arns, especially given the vendor relationship, um, and talk to the Deputy City Attorney's Office and um, proceed as uh, advised um, and inform this commission, of course, at the January meeting of, of what unfolded. That makes a lot of sense to me personally, too. Um, <clears throat> and may, may I add one comment, President Bernholtz? Please. Uh, you know, which is that, um, you know, you know, generally speaking, I do support the sentiment behind what um, you, Commissioner Mogi, uh, Chappelle have said, which is there's, you know, there, uh, you know, the, the activities that we our oversight activities take place in the public eye, and uh, you know there are laws and mechanisms that uh, make sure that that's the case. But we are also managers, which is to say that you know it's our job to oversee and to manage the director of the department. And I don't know what happened with respect to this article and the other articles, but I do see uh, you know commission members going to the press and speaking to the press, uh, and uh, you know, um, you know, at least in a prior article that I, I just looked at, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I would suggest that um, I, I would suggest that you know that from a manager's perspective, that we have direct conversations with our d director of elections rather than airing that out uh, in 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 the newspaper. So that I, I just wanted to place a finer point on my comment before that I think that's a better way to be and that's a better way to be as a manager. Thank you, Commissioner Chung. Uh, any other comments or questions from the commission? Uh, we are still on the item of um, agenda, uh, anything for future agendas, which I believe no one else had commented on. So we have just uh, the ones that we have. Um, we do have members of the public. Um, Martha. Yes, we do. We have two. I'm about to unmute the 1st 1. caller. You have 3 minutes. Caller, you are unmuted. Okay, um, Mr. Turner would like to speak. You're unmuted, Mr. Turner. Yes, uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, going into the evening here again, I'll be brief. I'm I'm a little concerned that the outflow of Mr. Bennett's statements might be actually to chill the comments of the commissioners. Uh, when uh, being contacted by the press. Um, I think that even saying no comment to the press has innuendo in connotation. So I, I might take a second look at, at that um, position. But uh, back to the Steve Bennett statements, uh, you know, I think the goal is obviously an apology or a retraction. He also, it should not be left out that he mentioned that his relationship with John Arnst and the Department of Elections was a well-oiled machine, which um, these are the kind of comments that I think maybe the uh, the commission would be well served to uh, curtail or, or suggest the cur curtailment. Um, also, um, if uh, the vendor could be uh, it could be suggested to the vendor that they stop using the Department of Elections or John Arnst as a um, reference when they go to sell more systems to other jurisdictions. That that would probably be a good idea at this point. I think there was an issue around um, 
whether or not John knew that the vendor was doing that. So um, these are things that I think are worthy of an agendaized item. And again, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Turner. We do have one more caller. I'm unmuting you. Great. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Heck. Excellent. Uh, David Pilpel again. Um, I was not intending to speak again today, but this sort of novel question came up. My thought is as follows. Um, I agree with, for some reason I'm getting feedback. Maybe it's better now. Um, I agree with the several comments that were made that it's uh, really within the discretion of the uh, president to decide how to uh, handle this. Um, I would suggest that if the commission is going to decide in the future to possibly do something more formally about it, um, that perhaps a letter from the president to the individual referencing the fact that the commission may choose to do something about this in the future and that this may come back in at a January or February meeting. And if the individual in question has some context to add or clarification or some other information to share with the commission that he may choose to do so. And if he chooses not to, that's okay too. That's certainly a way to proceed there are other options, and I, I agree that a conversation between the president, the director of elections, and the city attorney uh, would be warranted so as to not run afoul of, of contracting uh, provisions. But um, I think it's I, I think you've gotten the, the sense that there is some division on the commission about how to proceed, and I think that could be memorialized in a letter um, at this point, and I'm not sure that a letter of inquiry or a letter of requesting clarification, if he chooses to, to the individual is uh, out of line at this point, given that the uh, commission uh, may choose to do something further in the future. But that's just my sense at this point. I hope that's helpful. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Popo. Is that, is that it from the public? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, are there any other <laughs> agenda items? Okay. Seeing none and trying to cut off the feedback. Um, thank you all. Uh, it is going to be it for this item. I will proceed uh, with conversations with Director Arnes and the Deputy City Attorney and report back in January. Let me know, Let me know. that it's uh, 5.37 p.m. and the meeting is over. I wish you all a happy and healthy holiday and a happy and healthy new year. Thank you. Bye.